If you'd like to take your seats, we'll go ahead and get started. If I could have your attention, please. If you'll take your seats, we'll get started. Good morning and welcome to Sarah's 72nd International Convention. The theme that was chosen by the convention committee this year was the path to holiness, a Saren guide. To that end, what we wanted to do was to entertain the third objective of SARA, which is to assist its members to recognize and respond in their own lives to God's call to holiness in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. My name is Tim O'Neill and I'm a member of the convention committee and uh, I think it's before we begin all of our meetings, it's always nice to say the Saren prayer for, for vocation. So on page six of your program, if you'll please join me. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O God, who wills not the death of a sinner, but rather be he converted and live, grant we beseech you through the intercessions of Blessed Mary, Saint Joseph, her spouse, Blessed Unipra, Sarah, <clears throat> saints, an increase of labors for your church, fellow labors with Christ to spend and consume themselves for souls, through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit forever, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I would ask that you silence your cell phones. This is a retreat this morning. So uh, with that, I would invite Ann Maloney to come up. Ann is with the Sarah Club of St. Louis. So Ann. Good morning. Today, I have the honor and the privilege to introduce a man that truly loves his Catholic faith. You know, you can live as a Catholic without giving, but you cannot love your Catholic faith without giving everything that you have. And today, we've asked a man who has given everything he has to our Holy Church. Today, our common denominator our common denominator as Sarens is our love for the Eucharist. And so it's easy for us to love our holy priests, isn't it? It's a very natural thing for us to love our Eucharistic ministers. Today we've asked Father John Horn to come all the way from my hometown of St. Louis, where he's the rector of Kenrick Glennon Seminary, and talk to us and lead us in prayer. So with no further ado, I introduce Father John Horn. It is so good to be with you. There was an event not too long ago that we all remember. It's a man that we want to imitate uh, when you're in a situation like I am right now, uh, when you're making a presentation. When Pope Francis, you remember, came out on the balcony, there was that healing two minutes of silence. He bowed his head. He asked for prayers and blessing. We all need to do that for each other. And so I ask you now to pray for me and for each of you, but for me right now, that I might speak the words that the Holy Spirit desires to be spoken this morning. I ask your blessing. And I want to begin by dedicating this morning to Mary, 
You see a depiction of her in the Annunciation, a certain artist's depiction of the Annunciation that we'll talk about a little later as a backdrop for the entire first segment of the morning. I'd like to pray to her now. Mary, we turn to you and ask that you strengthen our childlike faith so that we might receive the word, the living word of the scriptures. Help us, Mary, please, to receive the particularity of the Father's love in the Holy Spirit so that the image of Jesus in each of our hearts might mature and be strengthened and filled with joy. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, being with you uh, just last night and at Mass and some of the hours before that, was an experience of being with a type of ecclesial family. I mean, literally. Uh, first, there's uh, close friends, Ann Maloney and her husband, Mike, from St. Louis. There's a variety of you from Omaha that I know very well. Uh, a father of a former student of mine from the early 80s, Matt McCluskey and his lovely wife, introduced themselves from Philadelphia. The Wrights from Reading, just a few miles from where I grew up. and. Uh, then a dear friend's uh, mother and father here, uh, Bishop Cousins from uh, Minneapolis, I just ran into in the elevator this morning. And it goes on and on. There's, you know how small the world is. And you just start meeting these relationships from different places that you know. And uh, you realize that in faith, it's not just a nice, secular, small world. But in faith, it's really a family that the Holy Spirit's created uh, to to receive from one another in the Holy Spirit, a communion, really. So I, I'm grateful for that familial experience uh, at the socials and that liturgy especially. Father, our Bishop Soto's uh, exhortation uh, made me smile. I hope it did you too. It was uh, a setup for this morning, a talking about learning how to pray. There's nothing more important than learning how to pray, Pope Benedict told the bishops when he visited in the U.S. So this morning we're not going to talk about prayer. We're going to enter into the prayer. And we're going to enter into our experience of the living word, addressing our hearts, particularly in love for you and for me with mercy and love through the scriptures, through extra-biblical religious art, and so I want you to buckle up and open your hearts because the Lord doesn't want you just to be present this morning and hear in the third person about him. He wants you to experience the image of Jesus in your hearts being strengthened by the love of Mary and the Holy Spirit. That's quite a promise. A special thanks to uh, Tim O'Neill and Sally O'Neill. That's the reason I got invited, I think. Uh, friend, friendship is always uh, the way the Lord seems to work uh, strongest. And a special thanks, Tim, of course, Vice President, and a special thanks to uh, Mr. Sean Yeo, President from Singapore, uh, for the invitation to be especially uh, with you this morning. I, now, if you put yourself in your shoes, in my shoes, just for a few seconds, uh, think about it. Now here I am leading a morning retreat to the prayer warriors of the church and others that you represent back home that I'm coming to serve the people who around the world serve priests and religious vocations with intercessory prayer. Uh, that is an incredible privilege. And so I'm especially grateful and glad to be here. I want to thank you. Thank you for the exercising of your faith in intercessory prayer for priests, seminarians, for religious vocations in the church. The title of this morning's uh, retreat, mini retreat, is Refreshment in the Living Word. 
Refreshment in the Living Word. And a little bit later on, you're going to receive a little booklet that you can take home with you that has a, it's a very practical aid called Wrap Yourself in Scripture. We'll be talking about that, and you could, will help you enter into. Uh, if you're a veteran at this, it'll help you go deeper. If you're a beginner, it will uh, give you a sense of God's presence like you've never had before. The format's very simple. Presentation. A uh, little wind up with some analogies and stories, some scriptures, some breaks, but also uh, participation at the microphones that you see around you. So um, where you might uh, share what comes to you from some Lexio Divina prayer that I'll be, I'll be teaching. There's nothing really more refreshing. There's nothing. That's quite a claim. There is nothing, and I'm going to claim it, with you and for myself and for you, there is nothing more refreshing than receiving the living word of Scripture. You say, well, the Eucharistic presence of Jesus. Yes, of course, but that's more refreshing. But that's why the liturgy of the word comes before liturgy of the Eucharist, for the word to open us to what the priest prays in the Eucharistic prayer that's all rooted in the word, scripture. So from the living word and our praying with the living word in the sacraments, in the Eucharist especially, Christ's risen, risen presence comes to us to refresh us, to make our burdens light because he's meek and humble of heart. But it all begins with the word. There's nothing more refreshing than the living word and receiving from the Holy Spirit to transform us what really refreshes us is the activity of savoring, savoring inside our hearts what the word comes to say to us particularly, a basking in, a being saturated by the living word, being wrapped in scripture, if you will, the name of the little book that you're going to receive, to be enveloped inside our hearts. Now let me stop. And I want you just to ask yourselves honestly, silently, do you really believe, do you really believe that the living word of sacred scripture speaks to you particularly, intimately, not just generically, to the congregation, to the church, but to you? In other words, can you say, God speaks to me, and I know he speaks to me intimately whenever I pray with the living word? You should be able to say that with great confidence and faith, because it's not dependent upon you and your worthiness. We're all unworthy, and God makes us worthy. But because it's dependent upon God's desire, Jesus' risen desire in his spirit to speak to you and I. Now, don't accuse yourself. Only only we would do that to ourselves, or the accuser, the evil one. But really just gently answer inside, can I say to my husband or wife, can I say to my friends, yes, the Holy Spirit, I hear God speaking to me particularly, without thinking of yourself as weird or a religious fanatic. Or, can you just say that? as men and women of deep faith, Sarans International. And I'm sure you can, but I'm sure there's also, there certainly is in me, a need for growth in the kind of confidence that comes from God alone. Confident that God speaks to you and desires to speak to you. Now today is the Feast of St. Benedict. I couldn't have arranged it better. A Jesuit. Where did St. Ignatius learn how to pray? In a Benedictine monastery for two years. That's where he learned Lexio Divina in Spain. For two years, he learned how to pray with the scriptures. Then he wrote the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, of, of course, by him. Um, that's where he began to write the Sermon of Spirits, from receiving refreshment from the word so today's the Feast of St. Benedict, and the Lexio Divina prayer that the Benedicts cherish and teach throughout the church is something that uh, Benedict, I'm sure, 
the other side of death is more present to us right now, cheering us on, wanting us to hear what the Spirit wants to say to us today at the beginning of your convention so that all things can be made new, so that there can be deeper healing in each of our hearts and in the church. St. Benedict promotes uh, in all his monasteries uh, this Lexio Divina prayer that Vatican II, uh, I want you to hear what Vatican II says in a little snippet about Lexio Divina yeah. prayer. In Dei Verbum, Vatican II writes this, or the Church Fathers and the Holy Spirit through them, Quote, in the sacred books of scripture, the fathers, the father who is in heaven comes lovingly to his children and talks and walks with them. In the sacred books of scripture, the father who is in heaven, heaven comes to touch earth right now comes lovingly to his children in the word and talks and walks with them when I was growing up my dad every Sunday after mass we went to uh, the local news store where we picked up the local paper and a lottery ticket and it was <laughs> I forget if it was, a, I think it was only a dollar in those days. Now it's probably five dollars. And we'd all go home, he'd read the comics to us when we were little kids, and of course we'd scrape off to see if we want anything. Every once in a while, thirty-five dollars, this is Pennsylvania, every once in a while, and this is before Powerball and all these multiple state, multi-million dollar lotteries. And we'd have so much fun with it, and every once in a while, uh, he'd win probably just enough to spend enough to go back and keep playing, you know. But uh, middle class family. Well, I'll bet some of you follow Powerball. Or if you don't, you know the enticement of it. What is the lottery at in your local state or group of states? I, I haven't been paying attention lately, but it could be 48 million or whatever, 76, whatever, 76 million. I want you to listen to something, and I mean this really in faith. This is better than Powerball. This is something, and I really mean that. Like if you found out that you won the lottery this morning in Powerball and you have $48 million, what we're doing this morning with sacred scripture is your spiritual inheritance and it really is. I mean, I know we would all intellectually say, oh yes, of course, it is more important. But deep in our hearts, where the affections run deep, we want to receive the Spirit more through the living word and be refreshed this morning. And especially when we hear the spiritual inheritance of sacred scripture <coughs> described this way. You know that Men and women are made doctors of the church because they have a certain oomph, a certain concentrated truth and beauty to what they're saying, like St. Teresa of Avila or St. Teresa Little Flower or some of our more famous ones like St. Augustine. But here's one that you don't hear much about, St. Lawrence of Brindisi. And this is what he says about you and I receiving the living word to refresh us. Now just listen. Better than Powerball. The word of God, St. Lawrence writes, is replete with manifold blessings, since it is, so to speak, a treasure of all goods, of all goods, all goods. It is the source of faith. St. Lawrence writes, it's the source of faith, hope, charity, all virtues, all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, all the beatitudes of the gospel, 
all good works, all the rewards of life, all the glory of paradise. St. Lawrence continues. Welcome the word that has taken root in you. Welcome the word that has taken root in you with its power to save you, to save you and I. For the word of God is a light a light to the mind and a fire to the will. A fire to the will. It enables man to know God and to love him. To know God. To know God and to love God. Forget Powerball. This is going to be, this is the front page of the little book you're going to get. The church named St. Lawrence of Brindisi a doctor because of the concentration of the beauty of truth here, of beauty and truth about scripture. I couldn't set a better stage, or the stage isn't being set. We're already into the retreat. Now, you and I have to check our hearts a little bit here. Again, no accusation. And if you hear accusation in your heart, repent a little bit. It means that you're being too hard on yourself. You need to listen to the spirit that, even when he corrects us, is gentle, even in reproof or chastisement. The spirit's always gentle. This is at the heart of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius and all the, he's not a doctor of the church yet, but I think he has a pretty good chance with the current pope. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens. I, I had to say it. I had to say it. <laughs> That's not in the text. So what we want to do this morning, we want to check our hearts. Are you really here to listen and seek receiving the Holy Spirit, the image of Jesus in your heart. Are you letting yourself, you know, we can be someplace physically but not really be there. Are you really here? I have to ask myself the same question right before I pray Mass each day. Am I just going through the motions or am I really here? Am I really here? Am I really seeking the Lord, or am I just going through the motions? I mean, I know God's so magnanimous and humble. He's present wherever I am. I'm going to celebrate Mass. He's going to be present and serve you and serve me. He's so humble. But am I really present to receive what's in his heart? So if you have some distractions or preoccupations with business or family back home or even right here with different things in the administration, I invite you really to like just turn them over to the Lord. Let your heart be seeking for trustful listening to scripture. Acts 17, St. Paul's famous uh, address to the Greeks who don't know the risen Jesus yet. Um, you know, he points to the statue of the unknown God and, and he says this. Now we know God or we wouldn't be here and we love God or we wouldn't be here but there's always a desire to know him more and because we're talking about God there's always more. In humility the mystic and the beginner are always in first grade together. Really. But St. Paul says this to the Greeks and to us this morning about childlike faith. Have to find it here. The God who made the world and all that is in it. The Lord of heaven and earth does not dwell in sanctuaries made by human hands. Nor is he served by human hands because he needs anything. 
Rather, it is he, he who gives to everyone life and breath and everything. I would add our next breath. He made from one the whole human race to dwell on the entire surface of the earth, and he fixed and ordered the seasons and the boundaries of their region so that people might seek God and feel after him and find him, though indeed he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and we have our being. As even some of your poets have said, for we too are his children. You and I, childlike faith. You ready for a warm up? So often we think about God, which is all well and good, but the thinking about God is to move us into a vulnerable receptivity to the living word to experience, to move from the third person into him addressing us in the first person. You and I, and the particularity of his love for you, having desired to create you. So here's a little warm up. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to hear Isaiah 43, but I want you to hear it in the first person. And whatever you're thinking or feeling as you receive this word, just turn it over to the Father who comes to walk with us, to take our hand tenderly as children, and to walk with us today. Just hear this being addressed to you. It's a warm-up. Remember, I had asked you, can you say in confidence, yes, God speaks particularly to me. I hear his voice. Well, here it is. But now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the water, I will be with you. In the rivers, you shall not drown. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. The flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in return for you. Now he's speaking directly to you, individually, first person. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in return for you. Because you are precious in my eyes and glorious, and because I love you, I give men in return for you and peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. Well, this has to connect in the first person because the Holy Spirit in the living word is addressing you and I me as I read this you as you hear it 
and in belief we receive it and we think certain thoughts and we feel certain feelings and we desire certain desires, but it also will bring up in us ordinary and perhaps deep unbelief, but loving, loving words to savor, if we savor, let ourselves be enveloped in, bask in, wrap ourselves in what's already present in the living word, then that unbelief like, like ordinary questions. I know what was, I remember first reading this and it happens every time, it's like an everlasting fountain inside. You, you, you give nations in exchange for me? You give nations in exchange for me, John Hoyt? No, no, I mean, well, thank you. I, mean, I thank you for that love and, and what I'm uh, permitting myself to think and feel right now, but no. And then you think of Calvary and the crucifixion, the passion, the resurrection. No, I, not, I don't just give nations. I, I give my son. Like, for me? For you, you, you give Egypt as ransom? Yeah, for you. Yeah, for me, but you individually, and how you reflect and savor and receive this determines your personality. Whether your personality becomes a radical reorientation to Jesus Christ who is maturing in you, when you go to heaven, you're not gonna be a blob of love. You're gonna be, St. Teresa of Avila is more St. Teresa of Avila. St. Peter is more St. Peter. You're going to be more who you are in Christ. And like you don't determine God and I don't determine God, but our participation is determined by how we receive the word and allow refreshment to come to us. What we determine is our well, whether or not we'll surrender and receive what's already, well, you remember what I read from here from St. Lawrence. So, this is like ever new in the ordinariness of every day, in the ordinariness of every day. Now that's a warm up. That's a forever repetition. That's just Isaiah 43. But it just goes on and on and on and on and on. So you know, RAP is an acronym, W-R-A-P. Now, when I was a little boy, when I was preparing for this mini retreat this morning, I was brought back to memories of learning how to swim and learning how to play baseball. So it was this guy in my neighborhood called Magoo. He was like seventh or eighth grade. I was like third grade, second grade. I forget exactly. And you know how little kids look up to the bigger kids to teach them certain things. And my dad was teaching me how to throw the ball and hold the bat. And, but you need to be apart from your dad a little bit with the kids in the neighborhood to like you need to be away from your family and really learn. So Magoo and his friends, you know, they were teaching myself and a couple of the other young guys like how to hold the bat and they'd explain the basics. We didn't know, but from watching TV, you know, basics, first base, second base, the object of the game, you hear about it in the third person and you're excited to want to learn how to play and you think you know how to play because you've been watching, but you got to play, you got to play and you got to make mistakes and you got to and the exhilaration of forgetting yourself in the joy of playing but what was coming back to me actually that I was savoring and this is sort of extra biblical which I mean I'm saying this not to talk about myself but to encourage you can you remember men women learning whether it's playing music or a sport or can you remember I was remembering uh, I remembered my first baseball glove, it's damn usual. I remembered like how Magoo and his friends followed the Pittsburgh Pirates, so naturally I did. That's what they wanted, that's what I wanted. So, but the exhilaration of actually then playing, what it's like to hold that bat and to uh, strike out, but people are still affirming, or to get a hit and to just enjoy it. Or to learn how you're not rejected when you made an error by a loving father who walks with us and 
takes our hand and talks with us through Scripture. The Holy Father is always talking about, in case you haven't noticed, the caressing, the caressing of the Father of mercy. Now that's a, he chooses that word on purpose. The Father coming to caress your heart and my heart, to be tender, to walk with us as mercy. Okay, so the acronym, so here's how, so I'm going to teach you a little bit, even though some of you already know, I'm going to teach you a little bit about Lexio Divina Prayer, which means on this Feast of St. Benedict, sacred reading and receiving the word more in the first person, just like you did Isaiah 43 a few minutes ago. Rap, like here's the bat, here are the bases. W stands for writing down where my heart was drawn to a word or a phrase. I have to listen. And if I'm not drawn, I just have to admit that and just sit in trustful faith. But very often, in reading a piece of scripture or hearing a piece of scripture, I'm drawn to a particular word or phrase. And so I don't go glossing over it. It's I'm learning to trust that that's not just me, especially if it's not dependent on my effort. That's the Holy Spirit drawing me. I have to be attentive. I have to really be listening. But I'm drawn to this word or phrase. And then that's W, R-A-P. R means reflect. And the reflecting is very simple. I acknowledge what I'm thinking and feeling and desiring. I, I chew on it. I meditate. I, I chew on that word or phrase or the meaning of the text as I understand it in my good limitedness. In reflecting, I ask God's help. I have a little conversation, but I'm also listening. And then A, W-R-A-P, A, I start to ask the Lord, well, how do you want me to respond to this word? This is where we have to be a little careful where we don't just take it on and think that prayer is just another thing to do. It's not. As you, if you let prayer be another thing to do, you'll get very tired of it and you won't practice it as much as you want to and you'll always be falling short. Prayer is not a doing. Prayer is a receiving. I'm going to be talking about quotes from Pope Benedict that really bring this home. He actually says if we're not like Mary in receptivity as individuals and as a church, Pope Benedict, that gentleman, he says, we destroy ourselves. Pretty strong words from a gentle giant. I'll read it in a few minutes. Receptivity to the word means everything. It is, it is a certain form of doing, but it's an act of passivity that I have to choose in faith to exercise. I have to exercise my faith. If I don't exercise my faith, if I just think about it, then I'm not really praying. And I'll say here in front of you, because I've repented many times, I think I spent half my life just thinking about God and thinking that was praying, and really I was caught up in all my own good works. And as soon as I started to hit my limits in poverty, poverty of spirit that's supposed to be blessed, did I receive blessing? No, I was harsh with myself and thinking I needed to do more. And meanwhile, God's trying to teach John, John, prayers listening and receiving. Now, you want to do out of what you receive, but first, 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 Mary. Without Mary, salvation history takes a different course. Peter has the primacy but lots of theologians write about how Marian primacy is first. Receiving from the feminine. Receiving from Mary. She teaches Joseph how beloved he is as a father, as a living icon of the father. Joseph has to learn from Mary the dignity of his masculinity and fatherhood. And boy, does he learn it. So we respond, and oftentimes it's just a gentle, quiet, it's often like a nonverbal yes. How do I respond to the word that's coming to me? 
How do we respond to Isaiah 43 when he says, I love you, I exchanged nations for you? How do I respond to that? Well, it's just a non, how do you, I just, I respond like in some form of love and thanksgiving silently and following you. And not just compartmentalizing my prayer, letting myself abide with that when I'm doing the wash, when I'm running a board of trustees meeting, when you're at work, when you're cleaning the kids in the bathtub. I learn to abide with the word. And when I don't, I end up hurting myself, falling away from, I end up taking things on my own. And then P, W-R-A-P, it's resting in his presence, savoring again, praising, thanking, saying, I do want to stay with you. Well, of course I sin 70 times seven a day, just man sin seven times. Like I, I get wrapped up in myself rather than in you and in your living word, abiding with the love you're speaking to me. But the beauty is, wherever we are repentant in joy without putting ourselves down, the Holy Spirit just regenerates us and makes us stronger. That's what St. Augustine says. So you don't have to be afraid of, uh, I don't have to be afraid, you don't have to be afraid that there isn't anything God doesn't already know already anyway. <laughs> and so when you see that you're not performing the way you'd like to perform in, even in a mini retreat to receive the word, we learn to laugh at ourselves, and we say, oh, now I'm going to receive what you have for me. And I'm uh, sorry, I got wrapped up in myself, and, but and God is so gracious. He comes, he regenerates, and makes something better happen than even if we had not done something, made a mistake, or done something wrong. Okay, so I can even feel it. I'm talking too much. So it's time to get in more into the first person and we'll get a little more practice and then we're going to take a break. So I'd like you to hear Zephaniah 3, 14 through 18. All you have to do is relax and listen. You don't have to do anything else, but you, that's a doing. You have to actively choose to, to let your guard down. You have to actively choose to seek the Lord and what you're saying to me through this scripture. And... Uh, Thank God for any distractions so you're not condemning yourself. And listen to Zephaniah 3, just like we listen to Isaiah 43. Then we're going to do a little work with this art, and I'm going to send you off for a little break and, uh, and a little time for prayer. But first, Zephaniah. When was the last time you were serenaded? <laughs> when was the last time you had somebody sing to you? I'm not, don't worry, I'm not going to sing. You wouldn't want that. <laughs> that would, well, maybe with the help of a, of a choir or something, but I won't alone. But really, when was the last time you received someone singing to you in love? Hmm. I mean, we were made for that. Well, listen to this. Zephaniah 3, which, by the way, is what Pope Francis begins the joy of the gospel with. His only writing to this point, we all know that the encyclical was written by Benedict on faith. I mean, he ended it. But his own work, the joy of the gospel, begins with this. Now remember, he's talking to you and I in the first person. So let's just take a few seconds and call to mind in faith that the Trinity is desiring to speak and to us and bless us here. The Holy Spirit through Zephaniah says this to each of us. Shout for joy, O daughter Zion. Sing joyfully, O Israel. Be glad and exult with all your heart. O daughter, Jerusalem, the Lord has removed the judgment against you. He has turned away your enemies. Now 
remember he's speaking to you. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You have no further misfortune to fear. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, be not discouraged. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty Savior. He will rejoice over you with gladness and renew you in his love. He will sing joyfully because of you as one sings at festivals. Holy Spirit, in the silence, we ask you, we thank you for the mystery and the truth that you have removed all judgments against us, especially wherever we've judged ourselves harshly or others, that you have removed these judgments against us, that we can be free from the depression and desolation and the sadness and the fear and the anger that comes from judging ourselves and others harshly, that you have removed this as we turn to you, if we just let you have it, if we just listen for what you're singing over us. Help us to believe, we do already, but we wanna believe more, that we cause that I, each one of us individually, cause your joy and that you're singing over us. Help us to hear the music, help us to hear the particular song. We place our trust in you. And wherever we might be straining to listen, we place ourselves like a little child in your arms through Mary. And I'd like to, us to take just two minutes in silence now where you in your own way I'm going to pray this uh, Zephaniah one more time. And I want you to listen for a word or phrase where you're drawn. But I want you to ask the Lord in your own way, what song are you singing over me? What song are you singing because of me that's causing your joy? And repent where you don't believe that you cause God's joy because that would be a lie that you would have embraced and you want to be rid of it. Hand it over to him and ask for the Holy Spirit to replace that lie with the truth of this sacred scripture. Shout for joy, O daughter Zion. Sing joyfully, O Israel. Be glad and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has removed the judgment against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You have no further misfortune to fear. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O daughter Zion. Be not discouraged. The Lord your God is in your midst, the mighty Savior. He will rejoice over you with gladness and renew in you his love. He will sing joyfully because of you as one sings at festivals. Father, speak to each of our hearts in your Holy Spirit. Help us to know what you're singing over us and we thank and praise you for, for speaking this great truth to us.
Now, of course, time is our friend, and time is a creature. Clock time was invented. God exists outside of time as well as in time. And so listening to scripture and savoring something as beautiful as was just read and proclaimed takes time. But sometimes uh, some things come to us instantly um, and we start to receive a sense of, of uh, what God's singing over us. Just like playing baseball, it's fun to play um, in the suffering, resurrecting, ongoing Pentecost that is our faith. Um, we want to play joyfully as we, as the Passion, Resurrection, and Pentecost are all lived out in our lives. So, uh, first time I heard this, uh, and someone introduced this way of praying to me, I didn't know how to pray. I, I mean, I knew the mechanics, but I didn't know how God spoke to me personally. I was 22 years old at Georgetown in grad school, and I had a good family, and I, I, had, and I knew how to pray the rosary. I never fell away from the sacraments. Um, but everything was sort of a numb consolation. Nothing was ever very intimate with the living word. And then some wonderful professional people. I was in graduate school. With graduate school can be a pretty lonely time. Um, and I was struggling with my old girlfriend, whether I should marry her, but I wanted to be a priest. And I thought, how can I reconcile celibacy? Well, I guess I'll just be a Greek priest. And I think, <laughs> no. But I really, I knew that wasn't really the answer. And then I started to pray with scripture, and I started to experience how God started transforming my loneliness into a kind of solitude and communion and having me fall in love with him in a way that would allow me to be married in a different way and that celibacy was really a gift. And that I could talk to my old girlfriend and tell her I still loved her, but that I, I needed to do this with this a bigger ecclesial family. That's a short version of my little story, but the point is, <laughs> I didn't know how to pray. It wasn't until I learned how to pray that my vocation came alive. I was slugging along, hating graduate school, just getting through to get a better job. And the real story was going on with the people who were teaching me how to play Lexio Divina, and the only reason I went, I didn't even want to go to the Bible study group, was because I was lonely. And these were nice people, and I couldn't write them off. And and then I started to realize that they made prayerful decisions about their finances and where they're sending their kids to college and from prayer. I was like, well, I have wonderful mom and dad, but we don't know anything about Lexio Divina or discernment. Or I mean, we, we don't know how to identify the spirit in our heart and then follow. And so what was conceptual, beautiful Catholic faith all of a sudden be started to become which it needs to for all Catholics and all Christians, as Pope John Paul, St. John Paul II said, as Pope Benedict said, as Pope Francis said, they keep using the word encounter, encounter, communion, solitude, the original solitude that St. John Paul II talked about. That's for you and I now, with your husbands and wives, in the gift of celibacy. That's your now. Don't do issues. Don't do issues. This is what the Holy Fathers, don't do. Let the Holy, be it done unto you, the Holy Spirit. Then the issues get illuminated. But it has to start first with receiving the word. Do Jesus, let Jesus in you mature. So I'm getting a little preachy, I'll stop. What did you hear? When I first heard, when I heard, first heard Zephaniah like this, I started to hear Brahms lullaby inside that my grandmother used to sing to me when I was, or hum to me, she wasn't a good singer, couldn't carry a note, but she'd hum to me when I was a little boy, Brahms lullaby. Then I heard Motown, Diana Ross from high school, <laughs> stop in the name of love. <laughs> I did, and I started to realize, well like, it doesn't have to be the Ave Maria. I mean, God speaks through Motown. God speaks through country western. God speaks through any kind of music because he's God. If I don't put him in a box, 
Of course, there's more, there's gradations of beauty and, and truth in, and that's why the Ave Maria has such an effect on us when we hear it. But what did you hear? I just told you, they're a little vulnerable. I told you that, of course, I want to be here and serve you. But we've got two microphones here. If we could just take five minutes, would people, or um, if you could raise your hand, I think Ann and Bob, I'm going to draft, or this, what is your name here in the front, right here in the striped shirt? Toby. If I had Ann and Toby, would you grab those two microphones? And then if, as people raise their hand, you carry it to them. Now, don't be shy. It builds up. It's, it's, we're not trying to compete or anything. We're just trying to share, like, what did I hear when I let myself even think about God singing over me? The, if the word joyfully. Just God was here for me. Joy to the world. Thank you. Now let's just listen now. This is what the Spirit spoke to individuals, but for us as Sarah International, too, as a family of faith. Just a couple more. What did you hear over here? Anybody? Three choirs up front and then if, you could, if you could just wait for the... I said I'm in three choirs, and one of the most beautiful songs of all that we sing is By Name I Have Called You. Before you were born, I knew you. Before you knew it, I formed you. So that, to me, is one of the most touching of all hymns because it comes right from our Lord. So you heard that as you ask him what song you're singing over me That's as an right. individual? By name, we, they have called us. By name, he has called us. But you heard that for you? For all of us, but mostly for me. Yeah. <laughs> And Isaiah 23, too, is very emotional. It is for it all could, of us. Yes, it is for yes, all of us. I'm, I'm so yeah. grateful that you're laughing. Thanks. <laughs> okay. But see, th this is the point. The Holy Spirit teaches us right in our midst. The Holy Spirit loves to teach us right in the first person. It is for all of us. But our friend's hesitation, that hesitation has to fall. Deeper confidence. It's being said, sung for me. Not self-centered, not selfish, but for me. Because... We've all coped with pain over life, and we believed, and we move on, but we start to set the boundaries of love without even knowing it. And God, think of these things I've been reading from St. Lawrence or from the scriptures themselves. We don't want to set the boundaries of love, do we? That's a nice way of talking about sin. That you set the boundaries of love. You, I don't want to determine because of old hurts or pains, I don't want to determine what I receive from you. What are you singing over me? Okay, let's hear from two more people. Yeah. I am not a public speaker, but uh, for songs. You are now. I am, yeah, hi. <laughs> Good morning to y'all. Yeah. Uh, it's a song by uh, Peter Green, and it goes, I hope I get all the words uh, right to this one, but he says, uh, when I speak to God, I know he'd understand he said, stick by me, I'll be your guided hand. But don't ask me what I think of you. I might not give the answer that you want me to. And, and, and if, you could, if you could just stay with that microphone just for a second. I won't put you on the spot too much. But <laughs> no, that, first of all, thank you, thank you. But could you say, and it's okay if you can't, could you say what thoughts and feelings accompanied hearing that song being sung to you? Could you just, what thoughts uh, or feelings accompany? It's just something I can relate to. So, uh, you know, the guiding hand, but don't ask me what I think of you. I might not give you that, the answer that you want me to. So as you related to it, hang with me now. So as you related to it, what did, what did you feel? Uh, probably striving to be a little